So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all uh, for stopping in to our um, to our session tonight about what it's really like to be a reporter. Um, and tonight you are here to hear you are, have come here to hear from um, Jetty Johnson and Taylor Epps. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about them, um, and then I'm going to hand it over to these two ladies here. So. Um, Newhouse Broadcast and Digital Journalism alumni Jetty Johnson and Taylor Epps both landed at Buffalo's WKBW-TV after graduating in 2019 via the Journalism Career Program through the EW Scripps Company and Syracuse University Partnership. Jetty and Taylor will share their experiences from their first year on the job. Jetty focusing on digital journalism and Taylor now does the morning news and wakes up at 3 a.m. <laughs> All right. All right. So I'm going to hand it over to, to both of these ladies. Thank you so much for, for stopping in tonight and, and talking to us and um, being a part of our convention. So welcome. We're excited. We're excited. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for um, <laughs> listening to us and talking about what we do every single day. Um, we're glad to be here and happy to share a little bit of our world with you. So um, we'll just get started. I'm gonna share my screen here. We've got a little presentation for you. Okay, everyone can see that. You can see our faces now more than once. So we're gonna just share a little bit about what it's really like to be a reporter. We will try not to sugarcoat anything. Um, like Josh mentioned, I do wake up at 3 a.m. Obviously that's not a wonderful thing to do every single day, but there are perks of the job and there are difficult moments. So we will kind of let you into what we do a little bit. Oh my God. There we go. So I'm Jetty. Um, I am from Stanford, Connecticut. I went to Syracuse with Taylor. We're both broadcast and digital journalism majors. Um, I am a digital reporter at WKBW. Basically what makes my role a little different from Taylor's role or a normal MMJ role is that a lot of my content sometimes goes directly on Facebook or is curated for those type of social media sites. So the types of stories I tell are catered to kind of a wider audience or more, you know, clickbait, not clickbaity, but like feel good, things that people like, like to see online. Um, that's a picture of me from high school. I knew I wanted to do journalism starting in high school. Uh, luckily, I was fortunate enough to have a broadcast program at my high school. It's my first time anchoring senior year. Here I am. I don't even know eight years later, <laughs> more than eight years later, still doing the same thing. So um, it's awesome to, you know, to see that type of growth. And I'm happy to be here. I get that story. Uh, this is me. I'm Taylor Epps. I am originally from outside of Atlantic City, New Jersey. Um, I always knew I wanted to do something like this. Um, I was really interested in sports growing up. And my dad was like, you really like sports and you really like talking, so you should probably do sports broadcasting. And I was like, one plus one does equal two, so that sounds good. I'll try it. And then I got to Syracuse and then I met all the people that did sports and I was like, I'm not prepared to know, you know, all of LeBron's stats from the day he was born. Uh, so, you know, I'm a big sports fan, so I didn't want to mix the two. So I decided to just go the news route and it's landed me um, here in Buffalo. So I was a broadcast and digital journalism major and a political science minor when I was at Syracuse. Graduated in 2019, came right to Buffalo um, in June of that year and started off doing the journalism career program. So that was um, a year and some change because of some COVID changes and all these kinds of things. Um, so that was, I was working the normal shift and doing those kinds of things. And then August of last year, I started working the morning shift and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit, but um, it's definitely a different way to work. It's a different beast and it's a different way to tell stories, but I'm really enjoying it and I think I'm, doing an okay job for now and I hopefully they would tell me if I weren't. Um, also, I guess I'm a dog mom so you can take a look at my dog. She sometimes helps me do work. She's very productive as you can see from this picture right here. She's also sleeping right now so wonderful. You can't hear it but everyone's saying on the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, like we mentioned a couple of times before, we 
first got this job through the JCP program. Um, basically what happens is our station, which is WKBW in Buffalo, comes to Syracuse and recruits for uh, four different you know, new house soon to be graduates to come and either be a producer or a digital content creator or MMJ. Our year, it was the first time having all four ladies and we're all MMJs, so we're a pretty iconic bunch and we never left, so <laughs> that makes us even a little more iconic. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, supposed to be a one-year program, kind of like it says here, it's, it's not considered an internship. We are fully reporters, we go out every day, we, you know, have our stuff airs every day, we have the same task as any other reporter would have, which is really beneficial and it's nice to, you know, be a part of a team like that, especially us being really young and it being our first, our first time. Um, you can talk about the perks. Yeah, so it comes with free housing, which is an awesome deal. So it comes, you know, fully furnished, you get rent, paid for already, heat, cable, all of that included, and you get to have lovely roommates. So Jetty and I were roommates for that first year um, and part of the second year. And so you get to kind of have built-in coworker friends. So you're all kind of going through it together. You don't have to pay rent and things like that right out of college. And you don't have to worry about bills. You can kind of find your footing. Like Jenny mentioned, it's not at all an internship. Like they, they help you as far as growth and you get feedback every single day on the work that you're doing, but it's not at all like a holding hands kind of thing. They throw you right out into the wolves and you start reporting and, you know, doing actual journalism. And if you need help along the way, you ask for it, you get it, but it's, um, definitely you hit the ground running. And it's a program that um, aims at keeping you within the company and keeping your growth you know, within EW Scripps. So once you're done your one year, the goal is to continue with the company. So they work with you and um, the other JCPs. So it's not just in Buffalo. There's some in California, some in Texas, some in Kansas City. Um, so the program is everywhere and they work with different colleges. Um, and the goal is to kind of help you advance throughout your career into you know a fully fledged journalist and um get working so i think the first week that jetty and i were here i think we did a lot of shadowing we watched a lot of other reporters and we know what we were doing but we hadn't actually done it yet and i'd say after maybe know, a week and a half i think after the first week we're all like the first week like, yeah my first story like went on air like a week after i arrived there and it was just you know on people's television screens, which was crazy to me. And now we do it every single day. So I think the growth and the opportunity in this program that we've been able to have is really, you know, why we get to be here talking to you all today is because this program really puts you on a fast track to do, you know, awesome things. And on to the next. I'll take you through a day in Jetty's life. Yes. So I work, I'm a day side reporter. Um, I am a digital reporter, but a lot of my stuff, uh, for a while, mainly goes on broadcast. I do both, but um, I work day side. So I start around 9.45, which is nice because it's like a later start, but I do finish at 6.15 um, because we have to wait, because we have a six o'clock show. So like when everyone else is home, we're still working so we can get you the news, you know? Um, but since I am a digital reporter, I do tend to do more of the lighthearted, fun, explainery, sciencey type of videos. Um, I really like doing that because I'm a people person. I love talking to people. I love hearing about people's passions. I love advocating for people. So it's nice that I was able to fall into that niche and that my job actually, you know, helped me cater that and allowed me to continue to do that. Um, one thing I like about the job is that every day is different. So like I said, I can tell a feature story today and the next day I'm telling a story about how COVID works or, you know, just different types of things like that. It's cool to know that you can also tell these stories in different types of ways. And I definitely make a lot of friends along the way, like this wonderful lady here. I'm gonna uh, play this story for you, just to give, well, this story basically tells background information, so I wouldn't even give background information. Um, but yeah, this is an example of the type of story I do, example of how things change quickly and of how cute people in Buffalo are. <laughs> I love this story. I was obsessed with this when it happened. So this yeah, is I would, yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. When I tell you this story is straight out of a Christmas Hallmark movie, I am not kidding. It was a near Christmas disaster, but it turned into a Christmas miracle. And I caught it all right here on camera. Oh my God! What happened? Are you kidding? That's Marsha Bukowski, the Depew woman 
who lost her $800 mortgage payment in the mail. My colleague, Ed Riley, spoke with her yesterday. And I said to my husband, I says, I think I'm going to be sick. And he says, why? What's, you don't feel good? I'm like, no. I says, I think I just deposited our mortgage payment into the mailbox at Tops. So I met with her on Friday to bring her some good news. A viewer who saw our story offered to donate the entire $800 she lost. Several other people also contacted us offering to help. But what happened next surprised us both. <laughs> the, the, the mail lady came in. Oh, you found it? All $800 have been returned to her by her letter carrier. 56, 57, 5800. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And she just dropped it off? Did she say anything? What did she say? She says, oh, here's your envelope. And I'm like, oh. I says, oh, my God. She goes, yes, that's the envelope. I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God. <laughs> Eager to spread the good news, Marsha went ahead and called, well, she had everyone. <laughs> Alicia. It's my envelope with my $800 in it. I have it. I'm so serious. <laughs> Marsha says getting this money back is like a weight lifted off of her shoulders. I did not plan any of this. I swear to God, my post, I've never seen that postal lady. <laughs> Honest to God. And to the dozens of people who reached out to Marsha to give her some financial help, she says, thank you. What a relief. What a relief. A, a, you know what? A Christmas miracle did happen. Honest to God, it did. This is a true miracle. In Depew, Jenny Johnson. <laughs> I don't know what else to do or say. Seven Eyewitness News. <laughs> yes, so that's just an example of some of the feel-good stories I'm able to tell almost every day. Um, as I mentioned this story, I was there because someone was going to give her back the money that she lost because in the previous story that we reported on her that she lost her, her mortgage. And that just uh, kind of sums up the way Buffalo Buffalonians are, like they're very much willing to give back and are trying to help. But it was, yeah, it was, it was crazy that day because I was so excited that I was there for that moment. She was gonna get the money regardless, but she got her money back and she was clearly so, ha I was clearly so happy. I stayed at her house way too long that day. We became best friends, so yeah. Things, things like this make my day. That definitely makes it worth it. So here's a day in my life a little bit. So there's me early morning. That was Thanksgiving morning um, talking about the turkey trot. So uh, I'm going to do it. I broke my day up by <laughs> hours. So I wake up around 3 a.m., which is um, just as painful as you think it is. But uh, I try to nap and sleep in shifts so that I get everything done. So I wake up around 3, and then between 3 and five-ish, so around four o'clock, I will, you know, check my computer and see what the plan is for the day. Usually in advance, I know what the plan is for the day, um, but I double check. I look at, you know, through our systems, I look through emails and double check to make sure that the plan uh, is staying the same and there's no changes happening. Um, sometimes I'll have to write things, so I will put together what I'm going to say on air, or um, I will just kind of know what I'm already doing and I have written it the day before, and then I will just kind of throw it in my brain, memorize what I need to say, and then get on the road to be on location by 4.50 because at five o'clock I'll be live. So, um, you know, every drive in Buffalo is probably about 15, 20 minutes. So I have to leave, probably leave my house around 4.30 and then get to where I need to go, probably around 4.50, close to five o'clock. I stand there and then I put, you know, they're talking to me in my ear in the little AirPod or the IV cord that I have. Um, get ready to talk, and then you can hear people talking in your ear, even though they're talking about you, and you have to ignore them in your ear, and then I start talking and saying things, and sometimes it's the right thing, sometimes it's the wrong thing, but the beauty of it is that I get to do it four different times, so I usually, like tomorrow I'm doing a story um, on Fish Fry Friday, and I'll do um, hits at 5.15, 5.45, 6.15, and 6.45, there'll be different ones, so in the beginning I'll talk about how um, restaurants are celebrating Lent differently this year. And then in the uh, one after that, I'll talk about how, you know, this is an impacting restaurants all over the state and how this season is really important after the year that we've all had. So get to tell kind of two different stories in one and all of that happens live. So camera's rolling, it's going straight onto TV. I'm standing there talking, doing things. And sometimes there will be things that play over top of me and um, 
things like that. So I have two clips lined up for you here of some live shots that I did uh, recently. So here's one. It's what inspired this challenge and how you can get involved. All right, Taylor, tell us what we have to do. And Katie, good morning. Well, it's all about getting your shoes on, getting out of the house, and getting active. It's a friendly competition that started up in Canada and made its way here to Western New York. So if you live here in Amherst, lace up your sneakers because you've been challenged. So that was, that. And that was a, a story about basically the Amherst, the town of Amherst in Nova Scotia, Canada, um, was doing a walking challenge, and they decided to challenge all of the Amherst in the entire country, and we have an Amherst in New York, so they took up the challenge, and it's the challenge to see in the month of February who can walk the longest, um, and that was what that was, so I figured we have a little bit of fun and start on my feet and talk about getting the sneakers up and talk about the challenge a little bit. This is another fun one that I got to do. They ask is that you give a donation at the door. Every penny will go to lung cancer research. So how scary is this haunted house? We're testing it out for you, sending seven eyewitness news reporter Taylor Epps into the thick of things to get a sneak peek if you're heading by. Hey Taylor, good morning to you. Give us a scare. Hi, Ed and Katie. We're here in Kenmore at Dark Corners Asylum in the dark. It's just me and my photographer here. And if I sound nervous, it's because uh, I absolutely am. But you know what? I'm going to take a deep breath. We got this, and we're going to give you a live look of all the spooky and scary stuff you can expect. So here we go. Okay. Oh, my goodness. I already see someone. Oh, all right. Okay. All right. <laughs> just the door. The good news is I know that they can't touch. <laughs> and then they scared me and then I got yelled at through the whole entire thing. So I get to do fun stuff like that. Sometimes obviously I have to cover more important topics and you know stand in front and give information about um, what's going on with the vaccines lately and things like that. So it's different every single day. Um, but sometimes I get to go have a little bit of fun and you know take people on live looks early in the morning and the you know in the dark and have a little bit of fun there. Um, so the rest of my day once the fun is over at 5 and 6 a.m., I come back to my apartment now because we're all working from home. Um, and then we have meetings to just talk about how the show went this morning and then planning for the day ahead because of the weird hours. I kind of have to know what I'm doing in advance because I'm sleeping during the day when other people are doing stuff. So um, planning things. And then from 9 to 12-ish, I will do interviews for the next day, start writing and planning and editing video and things together. And then once that's all over, usually I finish at 12. Jenny knows I don't always finish at 12, but I try to finish at 12. You never finishes at 12, but. I try hard to finish at 12. Sometimes I finish at 12. And then I take a nap at three o'clock. And usually I sleep from three to six. And then I wake up and eat dinner and then behave like a normal person for the evening. And then um, go to bed around 10 o'clock and then do it all again the next day. So it's, um, it's a completely different beast. I mean, Jenny and I, essentially do a lot of the same things and tell a lot of similar stories but um we do it obviously in different hours of the day and you know she sometimes focuses on that digital content where i am very um focused on the broadcast side of things you know being live on tv doing several things for you know the show and doing interaction and making sure that those like live tv moments there so um you know two different paths to take but i think both of them can be fun in their own ways taylor i have a question for you do when you're you? outside in the mornings during your live shots mm -hmm. what's the weather like uh, I, I got a shiver down my spine when you said that because it's horrible for the most part. Um, it's nice in the summertime because it's pretty much warm and you can, you know, do your thing and it's like 50, you know, 40, 50 degrees. You just wear a light jacket and it's fine. The sun comes up and it's wonderful and beautiful and birds chirp. But um, the other day it was, um, the real feel was negative two degrees. I was in a parking lot surrounded by snow. Um, this day it was raining, but you know, you still have to be out there. And the worse the weather is, the more likely it is that I have to be outside covering that weather. So it's, it can be cold, it can be brutal. I've invested in um, heated gloves and, um, I just layer up and at this point I'm just wearing a jacket so you know just make sure I'm wearing all the layers and the under armor and all those kinds of things like three pairs of socks and make it through but it's not it's not nice okay we'll go on to the next part um so our favorite parts about the job um here you can see me with Santa Claus um but I really like um seeing your work make a difference so um I really like the ability to have in, a direct impact on people's lives and see it um, within the same day. Like uh, for example, I did a story just today, or I did the story yesterday and it aired this morning about a woman who is struggling with a rare form of cancer and she is 
trying to raise money so she can go to Chicago to get treatment for this rare form of cancer. And um, at the start of the day, or when I interviewed them, they had $4,000 raised um, to help her get there. And in just, since my story is aired, they've gotten 6,000 more dollars. And it took them almost a week to raise 4,000, but in you know hours, they got you know, six thousand more dollars, and I'm not gonna say because you're, good at, you're yeah. good at now. It is Taylor's good at getting people money when they need it. I try, but it's it's nice to know that you know I played at least a little bit of a role in that. Like I, they came to us, so you know we took it up, and then they said nice things, and it's great, and you know you can see those kinds of things. And I've done a story about a girl who read did her own rv she did a whole diy project for her little camper in her, in her backyard and like at first you know she's just a little girl from a small town working on a project and she got to meet the people from hgtv from the tiny home program she had to do that she now has like a modeling contract and all these things and like the family's like wow it's all because of you and like all i did was really film her and put a story together but like though that little thing that one minute and 30 seconds that airs on tv or goes on that people see can really change someone's life you know drastically and it's it, it really feels good um i like being creative from time to time having a little bit of fun um i i specifically like to do stand-ups the part of the story where the reporter is in there doing something fun um I like to have fun with editing and um, <clears throat> have a good time doing these things and just kind of make a story that's a little bit bland or something that we see every day, have a new life and something that people want to keep watching and it's not just the same old boring thing you see on the news. Not that all the news is boring because obviously it's important, but try to make it a little bit different because, you know, um, a lot of people our age are going to need to be watching the news more often and making important decisions. So, you know, I'm trying to think of making something for the news that I would want to see or something that I would want to follow um, and be easy to understand. So that's why I like to make things creative. Um, I like that it's always a fresh start. You can, every single day is a new chance. You know, you might have a bad day on Tuesday. You covered something that was just not, not fun. It was sad or, you know, you had a tough day, but the next day you start completely over. You have a brand new story and everyone in the industry kind of adopts that behavior as well. You know, if someone, was like, oh, Taylor, you messed up today. You know, you're upset about it for that day, but the next day it's like, hey, you're great today. You know, it's very much an opportunity to start a clean slate every single day. And, you know, the good things follow you, but the bad things don't, which I think is great. Um, it's also unpredictable. You know, so on Monday, you might be going to the fish fry place and Tuesday, you might be you know, going to like a, a train derailment and Wednesday you might be going to a parade for a 99 year old woman or something like that you just never know what's gonna what the day is gonna bring you and that you know a little bit of a rush of just being excited and getting to go with the flow of the day and um, discover new things and meet new people I think is like a, a nice thing to keeps me going every day um, some of my favorite parts I love to interview people um, like I said earlier hearing people just be passionate about whatever they're passionate about. It's just so nice. And like, you can tell that they're just excited to tell you and that like, they're happy that someone's just like listening. And I get to learn so much from these people as well. I think one of the best parts about being a journalist is that like, we know a little bit about everything because we talk to so many people who know so much about one thing. So I think it's really cool that I get to like take a little piece of them. Um, I also love being able to, so like I said, my favorite part is talking about talking to a person. And when I interview my subjects, I always feel like we have such a great connection and like the vibe's fun and I'm having a great time. And I always like to replicate that energy in the package that I create. So for example, in the story that I showed a little earlier, like you can sense the excitement from me and from her and like how kind of chaotic it was. And I do that purposefully because I want you to feel like you were there too. And I want you to feel like you know this character as much as I know this character, even though you know, you're only seeing her for not 0 0.06 of the time that I've spent with her for those like last hour or a few hours. Um, so when I feel like I'm able to properly retell a story or properly advocate for a certain cause or something like that, that always makes me happy because at the end of the day, my goal is to you know amplify someone else's voice. Kind of like Taylor said, every day is different. Always a fresh start. Um, that's always nice because some days you do have bad days, but you don't have to think about it tomorrow because it's over and you messed up and like there's nothing you can do about it, but move forward and try to have a better day tomorrow. So that's always good. And it's a good kind of mentality to have. And we do so much work. Oh, I, I can't tell you the story I did two days ago. Like I, like I honestly cannot tell you what I did two days ago because it moves that fast. 
like I literally I cannot. <laughs> it moves that fast. You're always thinking about what's next. So it's it's I don't know. I think that's just like a good mindset to have. Tomorrow's always a new day. And I love editing because it kind of uh, relates to what I said before, being able to retell that story in the same way that I had it when I was first there. It's kind of part of my editing skills. You know, you hear her talking on the phone to her friend Alicia, like, you know, like you have those real moments that I also experienced and that's all in, that's all in editing. So, and it's just fun. I love editing. It's a, it's so fun for me. So. And I think it's cool, like, that's the cool thing about our job, that the thing that we both do is that we do all of this ourselves. Like, that's what a multimedia journalist is and MMJ is for anyone who, you know, is not completely clear. Um, we do all of it from beginning to end, from, you know, calling the person and saying, hey, can I come over? Or is this a free for an interview to, you know, driving there to unloading the camera, making sure the battery is charged. Making I was sure like, you're your camera crew? And I'm like, sure I am. <laughs> like, Who's your cameraman? I'm like, I am the cameraman. I have a camera. In help? I'm like, nope. <laughs> no. Like in the morning when I'm up at 5 a.m., I don't have to do everything by myself, thankfully. I have um, a cameraman, actually there, a photographer to help me um, do all the things live. But as soon as seven o'clock hits, it's just me. And, you know, for Jetty, it's, it's just her all the time. And we go there, we, we are the ones holding the camera, we are the ones, you know, putting the graphics in, we are the ones editing it and making it special and putting it all together, taking the pictures, we, we write the web article, we, you know, post it on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, we do all of those things and we kind of carry the story from beginning to end and really, we get to take ownership of it and it's our own thing every single day and look, okay, that was nice, that was the whole thing, we saw it start, saw it end and now we're on to the next one, I think that's really cool. Cheryl asked the question, actually, I think it's a good one, so I, I'll answer it. She says, I don't know what, you probably can see the chat, but she says, did you feel like you learned all these skills at Newhouse? Were you prepared to do everything when you started? This sounds overwhelming, so I'm impressed. Um, skills, a thousand percent, I think, got from Newhouse, just like my journalism experience throughout the course of my life. Um, you know, like we, it was the same thing, you know? We called people when we had to do stories. We shot it ourselves. We edited ourselves. The thing that is the biggest difference is how quick it is in real life at an actual station compared to at school. Um, for 465, we had from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. to finish a story. Whereas now we have eight hours and like majority of those hours are like waiting for people to get us back or like driving to an interview. It's just way less time and way quicker. But I do think the actual skills of talking to people, interviewing people, shooting things, editing, yeah, definitely were uh, fostered at Newhouse. Yeah, I agree. I, we did a lot of that same stuff just on a, a, an extended period of time at school. So we had maybe a week or a couple of days to do all the things that we're now doing in one day. But we also had other classes and college student stuff to care about and kind of fit that in between. You know, this is our job. and everything we do now so Newhouse prepared us to do all these things we'd done all these things before we just never done it all in the course of an eight hour day so it's just you know figuring out how to time those things. Yeah. however long for sure um which kind of leads us to the difficult parts about the job um just as much as i love that it's unpredictable it's tough that it's so unpredictable um you know as you can see in those pictures there, I'm really struggling with the weather. Um, I was out there one, during one of the really bad um, windstorms we had here in Buffalo, and it's just not fun to um, be out in the cold. You don't know, you know, you wake up and there might be breaking news as a fire, and then, you know, you have to deal with the potential of, you know, the fire might be fatal, or there's, you know, all this stuff going on, and it's, you have to catch up with it. You have to go and talk to the chief and figure out who's the important person to talk to and things just move so quickly and you just don't know what's happening next and you know it can get a little bit overwhelming and difficult and it's not always what you want it to be you might just have to go and do the important thing rather than do the fun you know interesting story you had planned for that day and then you have to cancel and all this stuff so it's it it does get um you know unpredictable a little bit at times um and then along with that there's sensitive subjects that happen a lot you know um we cover a lot of sad things we cover a lot of awesome and powerful and you know positive stories in the news but we cover the bad things as well and you know when bad things happen to people and they share their stories or um like i've done a story about um addiction and how um, the opioid epidemic has been really bad and talked to two parents that lost a child um 
And so it's never easy to do. I mean, as much as it is something that's powerful and hopefully can help other people, it's not easy to sit there and have someone, you know, sit there and break it, break down in front of you. And that's, so that's something that, you know, you never really get used to. You just, you know, people being so sad and so vulnerable and having moments, you know, you might be with someone on the worst day of their life and, you know, you woke up that morning, had no idea. And they woke up that morning, had no idea. Um, and then lastly for me, deadline is something I struggle with. Like we were mentioning, when we were answering Cheryl's question. It, um, we used to have deadline in school and you know, it happens, you know, it's coming. You have to get everything in by 10 o'clock, let's say, but you know, if you don't make it in school, you might get a bad grade, but if you don't make your deadline here, you know, it's your job, it's your livelihood and it'll, you know, look bad on error. It won't go up properly. And then that's your name attached to it. So it's just a little bit scary to be on the clock. You know, you have 10 minutes left until it's showtime and you're still putting things together. I've edited an entire piece, a hundred minute and 30 second piece in 12 minutes before just to like get it done and throwing things together because, you know, something happens, you're running out those unpredictable situations where you're running out and the meeting runs long and you don't have your computer and you have to like Da, 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 and that that stuff just like sends me into a frenzy and this is not my favorite thing. i don't have to deal with it as much anymore being in the morning but ooh, definitely lose your part yes deadlines are definitely tough um one of the other hard parts i think this job is very time consuming um i know you all have probably had a job or have had friends or family members who had a job that was like oh can't wait till it's four o'clock i don't want it to ever be four o'clock because I mean my deadline's coming and I'm nowhere near done like finishing my package like I it's a little a race against the clock um and it's overwhelming sometimes and kind of stressful like Taylor said sometimes you have to edit really quickly sometimes you you know it's not the best story you feel like you can tell because you just didn't have the proper amount of time to tell it but um one of my professors used to say you got to make air not art like at the end of the day it's just gotta it's gotta hit the television screens so that's always hard too especially because like i like to tell really good stories and if the story is not as good as i think it can be told because i have to make deadline like it's a little bit of, of a bummer um same regard uh this job takes a lot of brain power <laughs> like we write every day full, full stories from scratch based on what people tell us and we have to try to make it compelling we have to you know think about what goes first, what what should we leave out? Because we have to leave certain things out. Like it's just, it's a lot, like it's like you're in school, writing a paper every day, which is nice. I like writing. So it's just like, not, it's not that big of a deal and I was editing stuff, but like, it's a lot of, this is not a mindless job where I just sit and click or just, you know, like this is, takes a lot of effort. And uh, like, same thing with deadline, very fast paced, you know, you gotta, you have to think fast, you have to move fast. Even Taylor in the mornings, like if she wakes up late one morning and has a live shot at five, she just got, you got to go with it and, you know, like think fast, move fast and be smart at the same time and say the right things and not look foolish. So yes, the hard, the hard part is the, definitely the work. It's obviously worth it at the end when you get a beautiful package, when someone calls you and say, that was a great story. When you raise thousands of dollars for a family, like it's definitely hard work definitely pays off but this is a job where you, you, you have to put a lot of effort into it. It's like, I like that you mentioned it as writing an essay every single day. Cause I mean, we write literally short essays and we have to do it. And it's like putting a puzzle together. Like you get all these jumbled up pieces and you're like, okay, I have to put these jumbled up pieces into a perfect picture that everyone can understand and enjoy at the same time and get the whole message in no time. And it's, not easy to do it but like it is fun and it's a really good thing and once you have that story that just comes together and like just does it it's, it makes all the difficult ones worth it and you know sometimes i call jetty or text jetty and i'm like i don't know what i'm doing and jetty's like taylor i need you to help me write this line and there's people that you know can help you and get you through the job it's not you know just you against the world but there are people there that can help you and make it all happen so i think that's awesome um, yeah, and then obviously with the pandemic and everything going on, things are a little bit different. So some of what we've been talking about, um, we do are talk, telling old stories from back when we used to be in the newsroom. But at this point, we haven't been uh, in the newsroom um, actually working since March of last year, yeah. which when everything went down. So we've been working from home almost as long as we've been, we had worked in the newsroom. 
so we um, do a lot of, so that's my setup as you're seeing, it's Jetty's setup. Um, that's, that's, take my that to- My audio booth. <laughs> that's the audio booth. Literally my audio booth, I'm not even kidding. <laughs> and then uh, that's my, my home setup. So that's my, you know, my ring light and my phone and that's how I go live from my apartment here. Um, so yeah, we've been working from home forever. We do Zoom all the time. Sometimes we do interviews in real life, but I'd say maybe like it's like 60, 40 for me. Yeah, I probably do mostly Zoom, but I also still go places in real life a lot and do shooting in person. Um, you know, if there's something happening or um, like for this is what I'm doing tomorrow on fish fries, I went to the restaurant, you know, masked up and um, talked to the owner and shot some video and then came back to my apartment. Um, so, you know, I come back and my computer setup is here. My camera, I keep here, all, everything is charging um, right next to my living room table. And um, we do all the editing and stuff from home and all that kind of thing. And the workflow hasn't changed really for the most part. It's just- yeah. Though it's we're hard. working from home, it doesn't really make a difference because all we're really doing is editing at, in our houses versus like editing at a desk. I think for me, I kind of like that because I feel like, you know, there wasn't that big of a change when the change did happen slash need to happen. Um, but it is so nice that like, I can go out for an hour for a day. I still have a reason to get up and get dressed sometimes versus like, you know, being stuck inside all day and then seeing, you know, seeing it light and dark and then your day being over. So um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't mind it. I do miss, this, I do miss seeing everyone and, you know, the newsroom atmosphere and things like that. But it doesn't feel that drastic of a difference besides the fact that I don't see people. Yeah. I miss it a little bit. So sometimes like do. that four o'clock thing. With help, I need help with my stuff sometimes. Yeah, sometimes you need or help. Like, my script checks quicker. Yes. <laughs> At four o'clock though, when your deadline's coming up and people are screaming and breaking news comes in, turn it up. So I don't miss that. So I, That's why I go to the studio and sit on my, my bench. We have some more videos. Um, if you're not tired of us just yet to show you some more of our work, we can show. Oh, but actually we have a question from my Aunt Diane, actually. I saw that she asked. Um, can you ladies share what you think may be your next steps in your career? Jenny, you go first. Um, I just want to continue to grow. Um, I like storytelling at the end of the day. That's like what I like to do most. Um, I don't usually like put myself in my stories that often, not for any reason, but I just like, I just like the characters to kind of have their moments and to be that person to help, like I said, amplify their voice and, and be a part of that. So, um, I don't know, going forward, as long as I am able to continue to tell feature stories and positive stories that kind of move change. Um, even here, like I did one of my, like my favorite stories that I should have included it, but I did a story um, during the pandemic about mask for deaf the deaf community but it's basically it's for everyone but it's just a clear mask but it makes it easier for people in the deaf community to like communicate and understand and things like that so it's like as long as i get to tell stories that move and drive people i'll be happy i go with the flow so teddy moves with the wind um <laughs> well i'm i'm here in buffalo for a couple more years i'm here for the next three years um, so reporting, staying on the morning show. Eventually, I'd like to advance to a normal sleep schedule again. Um, you know, waking up not at 3 a.m. But um, yeah, I'm just kind of seeing where the where life takes me as well. I want to keep reporting. I really like local news. I like what I'm doing. I want to just keep growing um, my presence, my writing skills, and all of these kinds of things. And well, maybe one day I'll anchor and sit at the desk and do those kinds of things. I'm still debating on whether I want to report you know, for a while or eventually anchor, maybe do both. Um, if I'm moving at this point, I'm just taking it day by day. But I definitely, I, I see myself hopefully um, going somewhere big, you know, the, the big dream, going somewhere big, reaching a large audience, telling stories like we tell today to a lot more people who can see it. So I think that's awesome. We will have time for some more questions if anyone has them, but um, we just wanted to show maybe a couple more videos of our work um, we can go back and forth to like answer in order, but like I'll, I'll start with actually the piano one. The New Yorkers as well. Taylor for like, says Lemon Rice's cover tail oh, raps is answering all oh, of Oh, they're all starting at once. We can play this one first. <laughs> oh. 
just at the end of my... There isn't much quite as soothing as listening to a master piano player at work, and that's exactly what we have here in Western New York. Masterful artists. What you just heard was only one of a group of piano Picassos painting beautiful musical pictures for our ears to enjoy. And new this morning, Taylor Epp sits down with four musical masters and their proud teacher and shows you how they're carrying that Buffalo Strong spirit to a national stage. It's been an incredible journey. I've had highs and lows and just really at the end of it discovered and the love for music that I don't think I'll ever lose. Michael McClure first started playing piano at the age of five. So I'd always been able to sort of just plonk out a few notes when I was really little. The same goes for Christian Brand, Debershire Ghosh, and Lillian Kong. I really love playing piano. And I intend to like keep on playing for as long as I live. They're all from right here in Western New York, all about the same age, and all have trained with teacher Mary Handley for several years. I'm overwhelmed with their response to my teaching and the way they have progressed. Those years of training have certainly paid off because they're good, very good. I've been to Carnegie Hall twice now, but try not to get too carried away with the accomplishment. This year, all four took an exam to earn a degree from the Licentia Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto, and they all passed. The Licentia is kind of comparable to what a student would perform for a master's degree. And that's about all I can do. We all know playing piano isn't easy, but these four had to play for 75 minutes straight from memory to earn this degree. And it's something all of them have been dreaming of. I imagined it only in like, what a dream it would be to be in this situation. They each had to pass more than a dozen other exams to get to this point. Pianists from all over North America take this test. Only five others passed this year. According to the conservatory, they do think that it's the first time that any teacher has had four licentiate level students at the same year. And Ghosh won a national gold medal for his performance. This is a huge achievement for Hanley and her students, but they're most grateful for each other. And it's just so amazing to see all of their accomplishments with my accomplishments. And it just, it makes me really, you know, it's really heartfelt and very heartwarming. I really appreciate how much they've helped support I hope to be in their company for a long time to come. In Amherst, Taylor Epps, 7 Eyewitness News. That was fun. Betty, which one do you want to do? Um, do you want them to ask questions? I think we only have 10 minutes left. If you, if you, if you have questions, you can start saying oh, yeah. questions. Let them fly. Uh, any tips on writing videos quickly slash under pressure? Um, I would say... Obviously, you start with the most important stuff first. So I guess if, if you figure out what's most important, uh, you can figure out how to kind of lead into it quickly. Taylor? Yeah, I mean, I think just bullet out all of the things that need to be put together. And then, you know, what's most important to talk. And then, honestly, the way that you would explain it to someone. Like, say it out loud, think, okay, here's the important part. This person did this, this person did this. This is how it impacts this person. That's it. And you just right. have to let it go, make sure it's just conversational and it's not, you know, coming out like, you know, sentences, it's coming out like some, someone speaking. But yeah, like when you read, when you're, like, if you're writing a video and you know the story, but you're so concerned about how to write it, so just say what you want to say, like, to someone, for, like, you know, so pretend someone's there and then basically write that because that's basically how you should sound when you were telling the story anyway. Um, best advice for an aspiring reporter? Um, for me, it would be to, I don't know, never stop chasing your dreams. I know that sounds cliche, but if you want to be something, uh, you just have to set yourself up to be it, you know, don't let anyone tell you that you can't do it, you know, research the people who you aspire to be like, talk to them, do the things that you see them doing and just, yeah, I think as long as keep putting the effort towards what you want in life and good results will happen. Definitely work hard. And I think also never lose yourself. Always be human. Always bring you to um, what you want to do. And I think you'll excel at it. You will be um, 
you'll be great at whatever it is. Just bring yourself to it. You know, be human. Um, like Jetty said, she likes to experience things and then share her experience through storytelling. So, you know, just be yourself, be that person that people can relate to and, you know, think about your friends and kind of make things real for you. You don't have to be the stick in the mud that stands there and, you know, does the, the camera thing and, um, you know, what you see all the time. You can just bring yourself into um, this world and I think it'll it'll work for you the way that you, you already are. And then any tips for filming breaking news like fires? Um, filming it, uh, you just get a wide array of angles, wide, medium, tight, wide, medium, tight, is especially wide get a shot of the whole scene don't move too much the more you move the more difficult it is to show breaking news wide shots don't touch it really close in try to get moments of especially like you know firefighters and what they're doing follow things move at several points across the street get as much as you can try to keep it as still as you can um, someone says to me, uh, can you please share how you compose yourself when reporting or sharing an emotional story? Um, it's hard for me. I, I cried during an I interview. Cry. I cry. I'm not even going to lie. I have tears well up in my eyes and I'm just like, I hope they don't see me crying because I'm crying. Um, I think that's part of it though. It's part of it. Telling an emotional story is being a part of the emotion and living through it and bringing that human aspect and then hoping, you know, when you put it together, letting that emotion flow through so, you know, it can be felt. I think that's part of it. That's the reason you tell it. We had one come through the question and answer. It says, how do you come up with story ideas? Um, by driving around and looking at things and questioning things like, going to the grocery store and saying, why haven't I found milk in two weeks? You know, like where, where's all the milk? And then you go, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to start asking those questions and figuring out and getting answers. Um, just being curious and being connected with people in the community, uh, hearing who other people have buzz about, like these, these two stories here with these two young boys, like there were people in the community who everyone's like, you don't know Kev? Like, I don't know Kev. Let me go talk to Kev, you know? Um, also, there's obviously, you know, newspapers and other type of smaller outlets that, that help us out as well. PR, press people send us tips and things like that. But uh, initially, it's definitely getting out there, talking to people, letting people come to you, especially as a reporter. People will come up to you and say, did you hear about this? Or like, do you know what's going on at that baseball field? Like people, people want their stories to be told. So... They, they, they will come to you or you just go to where they're speaking about it to each other, it's like Facebook groups, Twitter or wherever, wherever they're talking about what's important to them, just kind of sneak in there and feel it. Thank you want to play the sneaker, the sneaker video before we leave? Yeah, let's do that. I was never a sneaker head. I never took care of my sneakers. The play pair always had holes in them. And now I'm a really big sneaker head. I have, a, I have a closet full of sneakers now, boxes and all. But he's more than just a sneaker head. He's a custom sneaker designer, turning bands like these into works of art like these. The opportunity popped up, so I took it. Emeka Wajed is a 16-year-old artist from Buffalo and he's been customizing shoes for more than two years. When I first started, this was intended to be a business. My parents would hook me up with their friends and I would get orders through them and they would support me. And now he's getting support from NFL players. I've done Shaq Lawson, I have some more players in the works. Emeka does all kinds of designs and he draws on inspiration from his everyday life. As I finished a, a saga or arc, I decided, I'm like, this scene would look crazy on a sneaker. So I took a picture of it on my iPads, and then I ended up painting it on a pair of Air Force ones that I ordered. Detailed shoes like these can cost a customer $200 to $300, but a simple logo or color change will only cost you $30 to $80. And that's how you flip $100 to $300. Over the summer, Imeka was customizing five to six pairs of sneakers a month. And he says no customer was left unsatisfied. They're very surprised. I usually am thanked with the paragraph and a half. And every year, his mom says he just keeps getting better and better. We just sit there with our mouths open saying, gee, how, how'd you do this? You know, he can make things look like actual stickers on a sneaker. He can make things look like they've been hand-stitched on a sneaker. Emeka hopes to expand his network of clients from athletes to musical artists. But for right now, he's just seeing where his journey takes him. In Buffalo, Jenny Johnson, 7 Eyewitness News. 
and it hurt again. Yeah. I just like that story. I used some so music. Cool. He's, he was fun. I want him to paint on my sneakers. But I just bought Air Force Ones. I had to tell him. What do you say? I just buy Air Force Ones. Oh, know. yeah. Get him to paint on. I want him to paint on dirty ones, but he doesn't. So now I have to buy a new one to get him to do it. But it's just so cool meeting people like this. Like, I can't paint on sneakers like this at 16. Like, I don't have my own business. So people in Buffalo are definitely inspiring. It's great talking to new people every day. Gotta love it. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, ladies, thank you so much for spending your evening with us and, and sharing your experiences and your insight. And this was incredible. So thank you so much again and um, have have a good rest of your evening. And, and we hope to be able to speak with you again soon. So thank you. Thanks so much. for having us. Thank you. Thanks for coming, thank everyone. You.